impossible to mission possible. And what happened was in Matthew chapter 9, that kind of changed my life. I'm so thankful for the text. Also thankful for the opportunity to be here. I already told my brother Alan, Donald said, if whatever happens from now on, he's responsible. <laughs> and all the organizers, because he's just unleashed a little psycho in front of you. And especially, especially in the word, which says Jesus, Jesus started going to the villages and preaching. Comes from verse 35. We have read 37. And since it's a study, I'll just take you back one, one chapter in chapter 9. We see all the healings that are happening. And then you come to verse 35 and you see Jesus. He starts going to the villages and starts preaching, teaching, healing. And all of that is happening. And then Jesus makes this statement. And he says, the harvest. He, he felt compassion for these people. And he said, they are sheep without a shepherd. And you might have heard this or read this scripture many, many times. I just want to draw your attention to a few thoughts in the scripture that we have read today. And what we are going to do is go with a few words. And maybe if you would like to uh, repeat that after me. Can everybody say that with me? Allow? See? see. Pray? Pray. Choose? Choose. Take? Take. Allow? Allow. See? see? Pray? Pray. Choose, take. So if you don't understand anything else, you've got the message this morning. And so we see Jesus is here and he's saying this statement and he's saying that they are sh sheep without a shepherd. And I'm thinking with a question that I have for you because in my scripture, I just want to ask you two questions. First question I will ask now. Later, I will do the next question. The first question is, why is Jesus saying Something like this. After he's actually doing the right thing. People are hearing the gospel. Some of the people are responding. They are getting healed. And still Jesus makes this statement. Because his understanding of this was connected to his mission. The three M's in Jesus' life. The mission, the model, and the method of Jesus. And that's why we come to a scripture in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 which is all those who are called by his name should walk as Jesus walked. And Jesus is here and he is making this statement because he is trying to tell his disciples that these people need to be discipled. They've heard the gospel, they've heard the teaching, they've got the healing, but they need to be put in a disciple-making movement. They need to be discipled and take this particular good news to their world. Because make no mistake, the reason we exist is we are in the business of plundering hell to populate heaven. Amen? Because that's what we are in the business for. That the Lord has called us and Jesus is here and he's telling his disciples. And one of the first things that we needed to do is to allow to allow the burden of the Lord for a specific need. That was the beginning of a DMM mindset that Jesus wanted to give them. That's why when we are training, we have, you've already heard our story. We started with one group. What we thought about earlier, listening to Jesus and walking as Jesus walked, was TMC. We wanted to do training, we wanted to do mentoring, and we wanted to do coaching. Because training is exchange or transfer of information. Mentoring is transfer of mindset. Coaching is transfer of a lifestyle. And Jesus was giving, starting this with the disciples. So he, he said, okay, there are, there are sheep without a shepherd. What are we going to do? So first thing we need to allow. And all of us who are here, my prayer is that we will allow the Lord to burden us with some specific needs in the area where God has called us. Because where I come from, two people die every time your heart beats. Over 7,200 people die without listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ in an hour. So the question that was facing me is what are we going to do about it? Allowing the burden of the Lord with a specific need in us. And then a divine diagnosis from Jesus that we need to see. And that is the issue that needs to be resolved. Because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few.
Can you turn to your neighbor and say, that's the problem? Great, yeah. If you're on the left and right, that's the problem. That's the problem we are facing. A divine diagnosis that yes, the issue that needs to be resolved is because the harvest is plentiful. Sometimes we think, oh, oh Ben, this is 40,000 churches just in India and different places. Oh, it's not that easy to work in India, I, I tell you. There are many churches who are still not doing it because they don't have the mindset. And that's what maybe I'm praying that the Lord will change. He will change the mindset as we come together, as we look at Europe again. Because I am talking to people who were burdened earlier, who came. And you know, I was asked this question. I was asked this question saying, Ben, what is the difference with the Europe earlier and the Europe today? The Christianity in Europe earlier Centuries ago, and what has changed? I said, what do you want me to say? A touristy answer? Oh, wow, it's everything is good. Or do you want me to give you the real answer? They said, Ben, give us the real answer. And the answer is that 100 years ago, there were people who were leaving different parts of Europe, coming to different villages where people like us were living, and they would leave their home. They would burn down every bridge to come down to India, walk bare feet, where their children were dying with malaria. They, they, they were losing their lives. They did not know when they will see their loved ones and they live there because they thought that people needed Jesus. And today we are afraid to go to our neighbor and tell them that Jesus loves you. That's what's changed because they were ready to do whatever it takes. Therefore, I come to a statement which I've been saying for the last 20 years because if you want to see what you've never seen, you've got to do what you've never done. Our places of ministry are not going to be the same if we are going to do this. Because if we do what we can do, God will do what we cannot do. And that's what Jesus was calling them to come and see. See the harvest which is plenty and see the real problem. And then the third thing he asked them to do is pray. Please pray. What do we pray about? To determine what action could meet the need. And that's what I pray that we are going to pray about as we go. What is the action that is required in our place of ministry? He says, therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. My goodness, what a, what, what a great thing to say. And we hear it and we want to do it in our own way. How many of you have released laborers? And sometimes we want to release laborers according to our choices. The gravest mistake, you heard the good things about me. 40,000 churches. But the bad thing about I have made 40,000 plus mistakes. Because we've known 40,000 ways of not, how not to start a fellowship or a group. Because when I started off, I wanted to choose laborers according to my personality. The, play, the people that I liked. But I started doing that and everything started failing. Because sometimes when we choose, we choose laborers who are great for revival. Some laborers are for survival, and some laborers are for carnival. So we, we have all these different kinds of laborers in the ministry. When I, mean, I started this work, I was looking for some wonderful people because I was from a banking background. I was looking for the accountants and all these kind of people. But who did I get? What kind of laborers? You know, that's the question that I have for you today. Who is choosing the workers in your ministry? Who is choosing the workers in your movement? Because when I started, I had, I'll ask my audiovisual department to help me with this. Christine, to set up this. There's two guys that I, the first two guys who I met, a farmer, a farmer and an electrician. A farmer and an electrician, I didn't, I didn't choose them. A farmer and an electrician, that farmer today has 12,000 churches with more than 120,000 people. I didn't choose him, God did. I just, I just took him in and I started pouring into his life in, in my living room. A farmer and an electrician, the kinds of people God started bringing because there are people that God is going to bring into your life and you and I are not going to be choosing them. God is choosing them. Amen? Yeah, if you want to give a hand, you got to do a better job than that, really. Let's, let's do that. Because all, hey, all, all glory be to God. Let's do the next picture. This guy, he, his wife was killed and strangled to death by his own brother and his family. And God called him to forgive all of them. And in two years time, he baptized 20 people from his family. And their, their family temple was broken down. And his brother, who was the murderer of his wife, became the first pastor. 
Isn't that amazing? Because God is choosing your laborers. Who is God choosing? This young man, he took me international. I was, I was happy in different villages. I was happy in different villages. And then what happened was, as I was, I was doing that, this man, this young boy, Rafikul, a Muslim boy, came to know Jesus. And then what he does is, he heard this. If you want to see what you've never seen, you've got to do what you've never done. So this guy takes 10 Bibles. Muslim background Bibles, goes to the border of Bangladesh and he wants to swim across to take the word. He gets caught by the military. Why the border security forces is running after him. He takes the Bibles and throws, him, throws them into the, into the water. He comes back later to see no Bibles. So he says, I'll come back next month to do this. So he comes back. It is a flowing river going, going to the bay. It has currents in that. So this guy is very ambitious. He thought he'll come in the midnight and find it. But he could not do that. He goes back and he starts praying. In about three weeks, two guys come from Bangladesh. They're happy and angry at the same time. It took them nine hours to find him. They said, hey, why didn't you write your name? Because you just underlined the scriptures. John 3, 16, Roman 3, 23. We started reading. We got this book and we started sharing with our friends. Now five villages are reading this. Come and tell us what to do. And that's how we went international. You heard we are in 145 countries. The first country, 18-year-old boy, a laborer God has chosen. Let's just move it. Our first lady leader, she was a prostitute. I, didn't, I, didn't even, I came to know a month later in our movement that she found the Lord. And she was persecuted by her husband because her husband put her into the business. Because he said, you need to be a prostitute so I can live off it. It was so dirty to think about. And that man says, if you don't, Renounce this Jesus. I'm going to strip you of your clothes. I'm going to make you bald and make you a public disgrace. When the entire churches that we had, they started praying from under the trees. And just one day before he could do that, he gets up and he says, who's this Jesus? Who's this Jesus? She said, what happened? He said, he came in my dream. And he said, how long will I wait for you? Come on, because I want to work in your life. What am I saying? What kind of laborers are you going to choose? I just have a video that I want to show you before I go on to conclude. And this video is from Nepal, Vijay Lama. Would you kindly put on the video? Like so many people throughout the world, Vijay Lama worshipped idols. He worshipped idols as part of Hindu life in Nepal, and he took it seriously. But mere ritual never satisfied, and Vijay's life became a life of alcohol, gambling, and girls. He became a gangster. One day, my friend and I decided to rob Indians on board a bus to Nepal, and our plan worked out very well that day. We waited for the bus, and once on board, picked out a passenger and worked as a team to steal from him. We sat beside him, made polite conversation for a while, then casually offered him a candy laced with a sleep-inducing drug. When he fell asleep, we got off the bus with his bag. After our heist, we went to a place to sort out what we had stolen. When I searched the stolen bag, I found clothes, cash, and a Bible. My friend was adamant that we should throw this Bible away. If you read that book, he said, you'll start to question what we do. A strange curiosity came over me. I thought, how can a book have the power to change you? Instead of throwing it away, I quietly hid it from my friend and read it. One verse stuck out. It said, a thief comes to steal, but Jesus Christ came to give life. A relative who had embraced Jesus and who was leading others to him invited Vijay to a gathering of Christians and shared more about Jesus with him. Soon Vijay wanted to embrace Jesus and become a Christian too. Jesus wanted Vijay to count the cost. Just days after, I began to see that Jesus really was my savior. The police came to my village looking for Christians. To save myself, I said that I was not a Christian. This affected me greatly. Later that day, I decided that I was going to truly follow Jesus and truly give my life to him, no matter what. Slowly, Jesus began to use Vijay to share his gospel in Nepal. 
Vijay began to lead people to Jesus and to lead gatherings of Christians himself. Since joining Big Life, Vijay Lama has helped start more than two dozen home fellowships full of new Christians, all turning away from mere ritual to a rich life with the Son of God. Amen. Praise God. Who is choosing, who is choosing the laborers in your movement? Because that's what Jesus wants to do with each one. That there is a disciple making movement waiting to happen in your life. In your ministry. Because every person that you touch, every person that you disciple starts a home group. Every home is a church. Every father is a high priest. And every home group fellowship becomes a mission organization. When that starts happening in Europe, that's going to, what our friends sang this morning, every street will start hearing about Jesus Christ. We will take this nation back. Because God was in this nation and he took you to all over the world. Now we come back to testify, to say what God did with you, he can do again. Hallelujah. How I many of you believe that? That God can do that again. That we take back Europe from the enemy. Because every new level has a new devil. You see? And every, de every new devil needs to be defeated. And he can only be defeated by disciples who are on fire for the Lord. Who are working and going, walking as Jesus walked. So what Jesus does there, he chooses. He chooses a team and empowers them for obedience-based implementation. Chapter 10, we was, come to verse 1. And when he had called his disciples to him, he gave them authority. That's an important, important characteristic for a disciple-making movement. It's like I just heard that story from my friend Graham yesterday. It's like a woman who looks at a beautiful dress in the shop. She goes into that she goes into the shop and she looks at the dress. She knows what, what it will make her look really beautiful. But then she sees the price tag. And she comes out of the shop. And then her husband asked, didn't you like that dress? Uh, why did you leave it? He said, no, the price is too high. Something about DMM is very similar. When we want to get into the shop and say, I want that multiplication. I want to see thousand. I've not met one pastor who has told me, Ben, I don't like multiplication. But then when they come and see the cost, they go back and say, the price is too high. I have to die to myself. And then we come back to the scripture, which says all those who lose their lives, what are they going to do? They will gain it. If you're going to lose yourself in that, you are going to gain it. Because when you choose a team and when you are releasing labors, which the next part of taking action, Jesus sent them out. I'm so glad that I'm here at sent because that's what I'm going to ask you in a few minutes. Jesus sent them out. And you see, when he sent them out, Matthew 10, and then we see Luke 10, that whole team is multiplied. He sent 12 out. By Luke 10, there's 72. Then there's 120 because Jesus knew that all these crowds who are following him need to be discipled, need to be mentored, need to be coached. Only then they will be filling Jerusalem and everywhere they go with the word. And that's exactly what happens in the book of Acts. That when the Pharisees catches these disciples and tell them, what are you guys doing? Because you have filled the entire Jerusalem with this teaching. May this be our story when we go out of sin, that we have filled entire Europe with the teaching and the life of Christ. Amen? Because that's what this scripture is challenging us. He says to take a team, empower them, give them authority to go out and do the things that you would do. I love this scripture even in Matthew chapter 10 and then in Luke 10. He says where Jesus was about to go, he sent them. What a substitute. Can, you, can anybody substitute Jesus? And yet sometimes we think, will he or she be able to do what I am doing? Or as good as I am doing? Jesus, let them go where he was supposed to go. And that's what started the movement. That's what started the movement. With ordinary people in the hands of an extraordinary God. Who loves to do extraordinary things with ordinary people. Have you ever failed? 
If you have, oh, I'm the only sinner in this room. You know, every time I fall, every time I fall, I pray, Lord, I want to fall on my back. Because if I can look up, I can get up. Amen? If you can look up, you can get up. You know, I just want to end with this story where Jesus has already taught us allow the burden to see, pray, choose a team that God is sending you and then take action, immediate action towards fulfilling that vision. You know, when I was a small boy, I, was, I used to get on my father's chest and put my ears there. That was my favorite game. And my father's chest would go, tick, tick, tick. you know, that's a heartbeat. Kids like that. When I grew up and I found the Lord as a, my personal savior, the Lord one day told me, Ben, put your ears to my chest, to your father's chest in heaven. And I could hear, tick, none should perish. Tick, none should perish. Tick, none should perish. It is my prayer that as we go from here, if we have forgotten everything that's happened here, that we would put our ears to our father's chest, which is saying, tick, none should perish. Tick, none should perish. Tick, none should perish. Therefore, our time for decision. How many of us are here who are saying, I want to be sent, and I am going to take a team to send out? If you are that person, would you get up on your feet? If you are there, if you are here and saying, I want to be sent, and I'm going to take this time to send others. If you are there, my brothers and sisters, would you stand up to your feet? Because this is what Europe needs today. People who are going to stand in the gap and be counted. Amen. Praise God. And in just 30 seconds as you close your eyes, Lord, we want to thank you for calling us. Thank you for sending us. And as we go, Lord, may we send others that every corner of Europe will hear Jesus is Lord. Jesus is their Savior. But more than that, that they would be disciples who make disciples. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We all be seated. God bless.